Part five, the stars. So we talked about the sun, we talked about the moon, now we're going to talk about the stars. We look at the stars in the nighttime sky, they appear to be points of light. In fact, our eyes cannot resolve these points of light, and what is on our retina is really a diffraction pattern uh, from the light passing through our iris. Um, even in the best telescopes, the, the, uh, all but a few stars can, can actually be resolved or can actually see any detail. So the stars are very distant. These are very bright objects. They're essentially, just like our sun, extremely hot incandescent balls of gas, and thus um, they, they provide very, very high intensity, but being very, very far from us, they appear to be points. The stars aren't necessarily associated with one another if in the same part of the sky. They can be close, but they may or may not be close. More likely than, than, than not, stars in the same part of the sky are not um, associated with one another. We do, however, put together patterns of stars in the nighttime sky because it's just natural, that's what our brains like to do. And these patterns, 88 official patterns are known as constellations. This is a very familiar constellation in the winter sky known as Orion. Um, I always like to think it looks like an hourglass. Here's the belt of Orion. Here's the shoulders of Orion. Here are the, the knees of Orion, and there's supposed to be a sword. Um, to the ancient Egyptians, this uh, constellation represented Osiris. Um, to many other cultures, it represented other things. But constellations, um, what is the best? Constellations are sort of like locations in the sky, uh, which are organized around this, these patterns of stars. Again, uh, these stars aren't necessarily uh, near one another. Here's uh, Betelgeuse, it is a red supergiant. Um, it is much closer to us than some of these stars on the belt, which are actually uh, you know, further away. There's the Great Orion Nebula. Rigel is uh, actually a brighter star, but it's more distant, so it appears to be just about as bright as Betelgeuse. Now, again, there are 88 official constellations. The constellations that sit on the ecliptic, the path of the sun across the sky, are known as the zodiac. When the sun is at any of these positions in the sky, astrologers use this as the sun sign for your birth. So whatever your zodiac or horoscope sign is, that tells you where the sun was at the time that you were born. Again, this is astronomy, not astrology. But uh, uh, sometimes a fecus is uh, associated with the ecliptic, but... Um, Actually, Scorpius is the, the one where the sun crosses through. There are patterns of stars which are not official constellations. They're sort of unofficial patterns of, of stars, and we call these asterisms. Asterisms include the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, also known as Subaru by the Japanese. They named the car company after this asterism, obviously. Um, the Big Dipper is not a constellation. The Big Dipper is an asterism within the constellation Ursa Major, the Big Bear. The Little Dipper is an asterism within the constellation Ursa Minor. We have the Sun of Triangle, we have the Great Square. These are all patterns of stars within constellations. Okay, so constellations are official patterns of stars. Zodiac are constellations on the ecliptic. Asterisms are fun patterns of stars we just like to recognize. Okay, brightness of stars. Back in the time of the ancient Greeks, Greeks Hipparchus was the first to try to categorize stars and catalog stars according to their brightness. He placed them on a scale. One being the brightest stars, two being the second brightest set of stars, three, four, and five, finally being the dimmest stars. Now, unfortunately, 
Uh, Hipparchus did not have the equipment that we have today where we can actually physically monitor how bright these stars are. are. So his magnitude scale was more of a subjective scale. However, we thought it was such a great idea, we've actually taken his way of, of, of determining brightness or his way of, of labeling brightness and um, put real numbers behind it. Unfortunately, first magnitude stars uh, are not the brightest stars if we place this on a logarithmic scale. <coughs> Today's magnitude scale um, takes into account that our eye is sensitive uh, to starlight, but not in a linear fashion. What do I mean by this? If we take one star and we look at another star that's twice as bright, it doesn't appear to be twice as bright. Even though it's giving twice as many photons to our eye, it only appears to be marginally brighter. Our eye has to, to operate over a very large range of intensities. Therefore, we've evolved an eye which operates on a logarithmic system. And that's what we've done with the magnitude scale. For every five magnitudes difference, that corresponds to a hundred times brighter. So magnitudes, all right, are sort of a backward scale. The lower number means brighter. So magnitude one star is brighter than magnitude two star. This goes back to what Hipparchus did, right? Magnitude one, the brightest. Magnitude two, the second set of bright stars. Magnitude three, the third tier. Magnitude four, the fourth tier, and so on. So if we go from magnitude one all the way down to magnitude six, that's five magnitudes, the magnitude one star is 100 times brighter. Okay, that, if we do our math, roughly puts every magnitude different by about 2.5. So magnitude one star is two and a half times brighter than magnitude two star, which is two and a half times brighter than magnitude three, and so on. If we look at the different objects in the sky and we put them on this magnitude scale, things get a little bit crazy. Lower numbers mean brighter. So if we keep going brighter and brighter and brighter, if our start stopped at one, we don't stop there. Zero is brighter than one. Then we get to the negative numbers. The negative numbers represent the brightest objects. So it's a difficult concept for some to get used to. But when you hear negative magnitude, you've got to think bright. All right? The sun is the brightest object in the sky. It's so incredibly bright, if we were to put it on the magnitude scale, it would be negative 26.8 on the magnitude scale. Okay? So what does that mean? It means it is 5 times 5 is 25. It's like 25 magnitudes... Um, brighter than the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. Okay, 25. So that's 100 to the fifth power. Oh my gosh. So that's a, that's a one with 10 zeros behind it. Uh, it's 10 billion times brighter than the star Sirius. Okay, full moon magnitude 12.5. Venus, Venus has a magnitude that ranges from negative 3.8 to a very bright, almost negative 5. Mars uh, varies the most because it's one of the closer planets to us, just like Venus varies. Uh, Jupiter, negative uh, 1.6 to negative 2.9. So Venus is the brightest planet in the sky. Jupiter and Mars, you know, sort of trade positions in, in terms of the second brightest planets. Mercury is very bright, but never gets very far from the sun in the sky. Sirius is the brightest real star in the sky after our sun. Uh, Canopus we can't see. Canopus is actually in the, the southern hemisphere from our location. It's too close to the su south um, celestial pole to see. Saturn varies from 1.8 to negative uh, 0.49. Uh, Taurus, Rigel Cantaurus, which is also known as Alpha Centauri. Also in the southern sky, we can't see that. Our tourists, we can. It's in Bootes. Uh, Vega, Capella, Rigel, Procyon, Betelgeuse, these are all visible uh, to us. So Sirius, brightest star in the sky. It's in the constellation Canis Major. 
In the winter time, it's visible just south of um, of Orion. Uh, once you see it, you know it's pretty obvious what is the brightest star in the sky. Betelgeuse and Rigel are very bright stars in, in, um, in the constellation of Orion, but Sirius is much, much brighter. Very close to the horizon. It doesn't get very high because it's technically in the southern hemisphere, but it's close enough to the equator that we can see it. Canopus, again, um, here's Orion, here's Sirius. Here's what it would look like if you were down probably uh, you have to go down to about Florida. From Florida's location, you can just see Canopus getting high enough in the sky to see. That's the second brightest star in the sky. But anywhere north of, of uh, latitude 35 degrees, you're not going to be able to see Canopus. Our Taurus in the constellation Bodies, um, uh, quite bright. Alpha Centauri. Um, the closest star system to us, Proxima Centauri, is technically the closest star to us in, in this position. It orbits way far away from Alpha Centauri A and B, but this is a triple star system not too far from us. Then another bright star in the sky is in the constellation Lyra. Um, I've, it's a certain polar star from our location, so it never sets. Vega will always be up in, in the sky. And of course, Rigel is the brightest star in the constellation Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse actually is getting dimmer um, as time goes by, but it's a long period variable. Some say, oh, it's going to blow up, it's going to go supernova. Uh, probably not. It's probably going to go supernova in the next 100,000 years, but don't hold your breath. That's a long time. Okay? Could blow up tomorrow, could blow up in 100,000 years. It's going through periodic changes. Procyon, um, another nearby star like Sirius. Uh, if we look at Orion, and we look at Sirius, Procyon, you know, you can sort of make a triangle there. So these are some of the brightest stars in the sky, Betelgeuse, um, all with, uh, you know, fairly low magnitudes. I think, uh, you know, going back uh, to our original list, oh, come on. I'm going to have trouble with this right here. You know, Sirius is the brightest star, negative uh, 1.47, then Canopus, which we can't see. Uh, only two of these stars that we can see in our nighttime sky actually have negative magnitudes um, that we can see. This star and this star, Canopus and Alpha Centauri, are actually um, too, too far to the south. Vega is almost right around zero. If you want to know what a zero magnitude star looks like, Vega is a really good one. To uh, see as an example. And then going all the way down, Betelgeuse is about at a half magnitude. So brightest stars in the sky. Um, the, all these stars are actually bright enough to see, even with the light pollution in Jersey City. Okay.